Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Griffey Podcast. With me today in the Blue Studio at Sales Griffey Studios is Andrea Walls and Richard Fenton, who are best-selling authors of one of my favorite books called Go For No. I have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, but it probably has something to do with getting past no. Before we get started, I want you to go check out Sales Gravy University. This is where sales teams and individuals from across the globe go to learn how to sell. And right now, you can take your very first course, if you've never taken a course on Sales Gravy University before, for free, any course you want, by using the code FREECOURSE. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That is learn.salesgravy.com. Or go to salesgravy.com and click on e-learning in the upper uh, menu. All right, so... Richard and Andrea, after I've just, y'all didn't hear this, but I've crushed about five intros and totally messed them up. Welcome to Sales Gravy Studios. It is so exciting to be here. Yes, an absolute thrill to see you again. So you've been here, we've been talking about Sales Gravy University, but you've been in our studios creating new courses around going for no. So just talk a little bit about your experience. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I have to say that I was super nervous about um, reading uh, a script off of a teleprompter. Just going to throw that out there, the fact that because and and the reason we do that is because we want to make sure that we get some pieces in perfectly. And as it turned out, all the technology and everything here in the studio was so amazing that it was the easiest thing in the world. And I am super excited about our course because it is going to be awesome. So like the those those big teleprompters that we have where you they go back and forth and are synced, that changed my life. We used to have little tiny ones and you would try to read something off of them and you'd mess it up and you have to go back. But you basically have the entire thing right in front of you. I have decided to go into a new career, which is newscasting, because yes. I, I was like, I can do this. So you know where we got those, Richard? No. So we were David and I one day were looking for equipment, and we're this is back in the then twenty twenty, and so Joe Biden's running for president, and he's in his basement, and he's doing all these talks, and there was some picture of him that was in some news thing, and I blew it up and said, David, what is that? And he goes, I think that's his teleprompter. So we blew it up even more, and we found the the, the brand name because it was just massive screen, and we bought it. It took us a while to get it in, and we loaded it up, and now we have three of them. They're not for the weak wallet. They're insanely expensive, but it changes everything when you're trying to deliver courses, especially when you're doing it on a teleprompter. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret about me. Uh, whatever they put on the teleprompter, I say. So I'd be an awful politician because somebody could just do anything and it just comes up and I say it. But I, I love what you said about the teleprompter in terms of getting it right. And Richard, if you think about, we talk about scripting in sales, like being able to know what you're going to say and memorize it. The reason that I use the teleprompter is because I don't want to have to like make mistake after mistake after mistake. It, it allows me to, to focus on my delivery, not on the content. A script is the same thing for salespeople. Very much so. And, you know, there's a, there's a um, we'll call it a, a railroad track that you go down and, you know, you, you, you lay a certain portion of the track and another portion of the track and, you, you know, you're making progress. And the reality is if people deliver things off the top of their head, then sometimes they start in the middle and then they go, oh, wait, I forgot to tell you about this. And then they go back and then they share their big punchline, which they were waiting to say for the end. And, you know, I think the the, the desire to sound natural sometimes can be um, overblown. You know, we think it has too much value. Sometimes it's OK if you're just, you know, making sure you do step by step by step by step. You know, lawyers, you know, in a, in a courtroom, they've got a very clear you know, path they go down, they ask a question, they get the answer, and they go, check, and, you know, they check it off on their little mm-hmm. on their little yellow pad. And by the end of it, you know, you, they, they get to where they want to be. And that's what I like about teleprompters the most. Well, if you're um and uh, and you're stopping and going, you'll bore the people to death. It's, it's the ability to deliver and sound natural that really works. So what was your experience in coming in and, and dropping your wisdom on camera? Well, first off... Um, I had no idea how big and complex and uh, complete your studios were here. I had a picture in my head, which is, I think, but most people have a picture in their head 
where they, you know, you, you think you go in and there's one little front room and they greet you. And then there's a little thing behind the glass and you go back there and you talk and that's it. This is like nine of those. This is like every possible different um, setup that you can have. So uh, I think Andrea and I both, um, I don't want to say we were intimidated, but we didn't know exactly how everything was going to go. And, uh, you know, you walk in, I think you walk in like you do anywhere. You want to do a good job. Uh, and you guys just made it really easy. That's That was, was so wonderful. That's what we want to hear. The Like a lot of people, they come here and people don't know about our offices, but I mean, this was just basically a crack house when we bought it and we rebuilt it. And the, so the front of it is a house that was built in like 1920, somewhere in that neighborhood. But the back of it's like walking into a spaceship. And so people come in and then they walk through the door that says, you know, on air. And the what, what we see people experience is, OMG, like I had no idea this was back here. And people, even people who are in our city have no idea what we do here. And I don't know what your experience is when you saw it, because I see it every single day. So I, I have to see it through other people's eyes because it just looks mundane to me now because this is just what we do. Yeah, we're moving here now. <laughs> That's what Victor Antonio said. He said, I'm coming down. I'm going to live in your studio for a while. But it is, it's for, for what we do as people who we deliver content, we train, uh, we are on camera a lot. You can, you, know, you can imagine that from my standpoint what this does from a convenience standpoint. Like anything we want to do, even the studio we're sitting in right now, which is now converted to a podcast studio, this morning I did a two-hour leadership training in here for a large company, but we can convert it out. So it just makes it so much easier to have the flexibility to, to do really anything that you need to do for a client. Absolutely. Um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, I know you don't intend on renting your facility out to outside places, but I imagine there are a hundred businesses who would die to use this facility if they even knew it existed. So keep it a secret. Okay? Well, we talk about multiple streams of income and this is what, <laughs> that is one of them. Well, you know, we had, we actually, when we built it, we, because we built this before the pandemic and we built it because we thought that there was going to be a lot more virtual training and we were looking at the virtual training we were delivering and it was awful because we had bad backdrops. We were skydiving down into computers and we, so we built it originally for that particular mm. reason. And then the pandemic happened and we were, we got, we, we just exploded. But when we originally did this, we thought we would rent the place to law firms who were doing depositions mm. or we would rent it at local to a, like a lot of movies, our, our movies are shot around here. We've got a huge green screen in, in the green studio, uh, but we've really never gone down that road because we've just been so busy all the time. Yeah. It's not quite big enough to rent out for the prom, you know, but it's, it's pretty darn big. Not the prom. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that we're going to be getting Go For No content on Salesgrave University. Before we get jump, I want to jump into um, some of the concepts that I know that you're experts in, but maybe share a little bit about the content that you shot and what people can expect when they come to Salesgrave University uh, to, uh, to consume your courses. Yeah, so, um, well, the content is, is part uh, concept. Part about what the whole go for no concept is and and richard tells like i guess you'd say the core go for no story the foundation of what it is um and then we get a little more tactical and a little more how to so it's part what and why uh, of go for no which fundamentally is to intentionally in, intentionally increase your failure rate intentionally hear no more often because when you do that the yeses will follow uh and and that of course doesn't mean that you should just hear no over and over and over again and not improve and, and not use that no as data. Um, and so there's so many benefits to no, and I'm already going down a training path <laughs> whenever I start talking about it, I can't help myself. Um, and so we talk a little bit about the concept, and then we talk about, you know, how to, how, how to actually put go for no into practice, like, um, you know, setting no goals and, and looking for the opportunities to ask fundamentally. And it's, it's amazing how, um, you know, Jeb, not to get too off track, but one of the things that I do that I, that is fun for me in our business is I do this go for no 21 day challenge. And I have people think about what are the moments where you should be asking, you know, what are those kind of go for no moments? And it's amazing how people aren't mindful about what those are. 
You know, it's kind of like, you know, just start talking to people to start presenting. And it's like, well, wait a minute. What are the questions that you should be asking? And and is there maybe a central question that you should ask that um, lets you know if this person is qualified or maybe you should disqualify this person? So um, it was it was just shooting. It was so uh, much fun because it, it forced us to take our best stuff and narrow it down into kind of the best of. Right. And when you say best of, um, when we were trying to decide what content to put together for Sales Gravy University, um, we sat down and we looked at all our content. We had about 30 hours worth of stuff that we could do. And we said, well, we're, we're not going to do that. That's obvious. Um, what can we do? And so what Andrea just said, we decided let's get the best two hours of content that we have. Let's condense it into a course that in this case ended up being 18 modules. And it's funny when you set out to, to do a course, a lot of people go, we're going to do 20 modules or we're going to do 10. We just said, forget that. However many modules it is, it is. It's just the best stuff. Turned out to be 18 modules. And so we created that very specifically for salespeople. And then we said, okay, what about from the sales leader perspective? Sales leaders got to look at it differently. It's not about the problem. It's about helping someone through the issue, right? Um, you know, so the, the salesperson needs training and coaching. Well, the sales leader has to be the coach. So we said, okay, what is the perspective from a leader standpoint who wants to get their team to go for no? In other words, to fail more often so that they can be more successful. And so we, we put those programs together specifically so that we'd be offering you guys in what you do the best of the content that we have. And I think that what's brilliant about this is this, uh, this course for the leaders. Because if you, if you think about leaders, I'm sure that this has never happened to you, but leaders say, how do I get my people to close more business, right? And what they're really saying is, how do I get my people to go for no? How do I get my people to ask? And, and in so many cases, and you said this to me earlier while we were having lunch, you said, you know, we're, especially as sales trainers, and I know that I do this, I mean, we're typically creating content for the end user, for for the, the salespersons on the street, and we kind of ignore what's happening with the leader and the salesperson. So uh, salespeople are afraid of rejection. Salespeople hesitate. They pull back. They change their demeanor. They show up uh, insecure versus confident. And if leaders want to close more business and hit their numbers, they've got to get their salespeople who are often in front of customers when the sales leader is not there to help them. They've got to get them to perform better. So, so talk to me a little bit about this course for the leader. And, and let's just dive into this for a moment. What do leaders need to do to help their salespeople deal with this fear of rejection and go for no more often? Well, one of the things that we kick off the course with is talking about the need for empathy from a leadership perspective. I mean, they have to be, and actually Rich is, uh, asks a question. I know you, you know, from a, you didn't sign up to be a therapist. You're a sales leader. Are you sure about that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the question we pose. And sadly, you know, it's kind of true because yep. so much of what you're dealing with is, um, is not it's not always scripts and tactics, Jeb. I know you know that, and but we all want to think that that that's what it is. We all want to just have that magic phrase that what's that one thing that I can say that will handle every objection? And and people think that if they could just learn these couple magic phrases, if they could just learn a couple good scripts, that it's over. I'm done. I I, I will nail this. And so much of it is mindset. It's what you go into. And so from a sales leadership standpoint, we point out in the beginning, you've got to have empathy and be aware of the fact that there is no magic bullet for your people and that if they're not doing what you talk about, what is trained, what you teach them to do, you've got to know there's something else going on. And probably that something else is what we all fear to some degree. The baggage we all have is fear of rejection. And so you need to be mindful of that and be willing to address that. And enlightened leaders do that. You know, they don't, we call it the elephant in the room. And enlightened leaders deal with that elephant. It takes courage because you have to be a little vulnerable. You have to be willing to admit some weakness or what, what is perceived as weakness. You know, in sales, we always 
want to be like super confident and we're problem solvers and we're, we're can do people. But uh, and so I think the fear of rejection is seen a little bit as weakness. Yeah, I think I mean, I think, Richard, that leaders have to go for know themselves. I know that when I'm teaching fanatical prospecting, for example, and I'm with a group of salespeople and I see salespeople hesitating, it's not an unusual for me to sit next to a person and grab a list and call. And I get my head handed to me. I get people who say the most awful things. I don't know what to say. I mess up the messaging. I, I have, in some cases, I have absolutely no clue what I'm selling. Every once in a while, I get lucky. And the person says, hey, yeah, I'm ready to talk about this. And I'm like looking for anybody to help me. And you know what's interesting? The salespeople never notice all the mistakes. Like nobody ever says, gosh, you know, you really flubbed that objection turnaround or, you know, that that was like awful. You know, no wonder the person told you no. They never see that. What they see is me sitting next to them trying. And I, that earns more respect than anything. And I think that a lot of leaders, you said vulnerability, Andrea. I think a lot of leaders aren't willing to allow themselves to fail in front of their team because they think it makes them look weak when it actually it makes them look strong. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we had a company that we worked with years ago. You know, they'd rolled out go for no and, uh, you know, they weren't getting the results they wanted. We don't understand why we're not getting the results that we want. And the reality was the leadership wasn't doing go for no. They weren't going for no. They weren't good role models. They weren't getting in the trenches. They weren't willing to pick up the phone and make calls with their people because I think what they thought was as leaders, they didn't want to show any vulnerability. They didn't want anybody to think maybe they were anything less than perfect. And so we tried to figure out, you know, so, you know, how are we going to handle this? What, you know, what do we do? And so at the, at the very end of the program that we did for the leaders, um, I told the story about the great Zimbrati. Now, I think the story's a little bit made up, but I think it's probably got some, some truth to it. But the, the, the basic story is the great Zimbrati was the greatest tightrope walker of all time. And he was doing an act where he was walking across a tightrope over Niagara Falls. And hundreds of people had shown up to see this amazing show by the great Zimbrati. And he shows up and he looks and he sees that it's raining, it's sleeting, the wind is blowing, the rope is swaying in the breeze. And he goes, I'm not doing it. Okay, I'm just, no, no, the, the, the show's canceled. And the manager, you know, his promoter says, you can't do it, we have hundreds of people. We sold all these tickets, you, you've got to do it. And so the great Zimbrati, even though it was against his own better judgment, said, fine. He gets his, he gets his little balance pole, he gets on the rope, he starts walking across, it's, the thing is really swinging back and forth. He gets all the way across and he's, he's survived it, he's done. He says, that's it, the show is over, thank you all for coming out. And somebody in the crowd yells out, hey, Zimbrati, I dare you to go back again. And Zimbrati goes, oh, that's very funny. Now, thank you for the dare, but the, but, but the show is over. And he says, Zimbrati, if you're as good as you say you are, you should be able to go back again. And not only should you be able to go back again, you should be able to do it pushing a wheelbarrow. And this guy emerges from the crowd and he's got a wheelbarrow with him and he rolls it up and stops it right into the great Zimbrati. And the Zimbrati looks at him, looks at the wind blowing, and he says, he says, do you really think I could go back pushing a wheelbarrow? The guy says, absolutely. He said, great, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> now, I told the story to this group of sales leaders because I was pretty much saying, hey, you're telling your people all the stuff they can do. You haven't gotten in the wheelbarrow, man. You know, you haven't committed yourself. You're, you're just telling people to do stuff but you're not really, really committed. And uh, sometimes sometimes they need a direct message like that. That is a good story. I love that. Thank you. But I think you're right. I think that the leader thinks I don't have to do these things or I don't have to, I don't have to go out and, uh, and face rejection. And a lot of young salespeople lose out because the leader doesn't like go on a sales call and say, watch me do it. Let, let me show you how it's done. And if they get out and they didn't close the deal, the leader's able to say, okay, walk me through what I did wrong. And But that's how people learn. And they they respect you more when you get in the trenches, when you get in the wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. I, I want to back you up a little bit because and and I because I this is a little bit about some credibility because you've got this go for no, <laughs> uh, you know, business that you've built. But 
I, I don't know if you're comfortable doing this, if you're not just say so, but I'd love for you to go back and tell our audience, like, how did you start your business? Because like, it is really a cool story about starting your business, facing failure, trying to figure things out and like never giving up and keeping going, which is really your message until like you've built an empire around this entire concept of facing rejection. Yeah, we started our business uh, with a idea of who we wanted to serve. And I think that was that was a really important part of it. Uh, we were very clear that we wanted to work with big retailers. Um, we wanted to work with, you know, peop- companies that had 100 or more stores. So we were very much um, B2B selling. So you couple this great vision that we had also with the idea that we also had no idea what we were doing. So it was a powerful combination. <laughs> And uh, we made the world's worst. It's funny. I, I, I actually did this. I told a microbite on this. We, we made the world's worst brochure because, Jeb, back then there was no Canva. There was no like, here, you can make a four color brochure. You could order it online and have it on your doorstep in 72 hours. No, Richard and I typed stuff up in Word because everything we did was bootstrapped. Uh, We wanted to start our own business so badly that we left our corporate jobs with not much of a safety net. I mean, we had a very limited time frame. So we created this god-awful brochure, and we sent it out, and we decided to create a campaign, really. We said, let's we'll we'll do direct mail, and we'll follow it up with phone calls. So I would call, and I'd say, hey, we sent you a package. And half the time, you know, I would hear, what package? Never got a package. Let me send you another package send another package, follow up on that package. And it was just cold calling and mailing and cold calling and mailing. And eventually we got a call from a company who was like, hey, do you guys have a video? And we were like, nope. Do you have an outline of this program? Because it looks really good. Nope. Do you guys have anything? Do you guys have business cards? I was like, we are really new. (laughs) And then uh, she said, well, I have to tell you, This program sounds interesting. The one thing that we were smart about doing was we spoke the customer's language. None of our materials were fancy in terms of wording. We didn't, we weren't like trying to impress people with rocket science language and we do X, Y, and Z and we're so fancy and you don't even, you're not even going to be able to understand what we do because we're so smart. No, we were like, hey, we will teach your retail sales managers how to get results from your salespeople. And they were like, that's what we want. So I think do that's what we learned was you've got to speak the customer's language. And we got that date, um, didn't charge enough. Richard found out from the president of the company, literally <laughs> told us we did not charge enough. So everything was a learning for us and everything was, uh, we went for no ourselves a lot. And we still do this very day. I think sometimes people look at companies like ours, like yours, and they think, uh, Oh, they just get inbound leads all day long and you know, they don't have to they don't have to sell anymore. Uh, I got a call the other day from a customer who said, you know, we're thinking about hiring you guys to speak, um, but we don't want just some presenter. I mean, we want people who sell and I was like, I can assure you I sell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're not above selling here at Go for No. So, it's but it's been a fun journey and and What we've learned the most is exactly what we teach. We have literally failed our way to some level of success. And when we get, I think the biggest obstacle for us is, like a lot of salespeople, complacent, where we're comfortable. And we think like, okay, let's just kick back. And then we're like, wow, what are we doing? We're just, you know, we we need to get out there. We need to learn more. We need to go to more conferences, write a new book, uh, sell more. And uh, so we we keep pushing ourselves. Coming to Sales Gravy University was a good way to push ourselves out of our comfort zone, do something new. I like it. So let me ask you a question, Richard, because mm-hmm. um, like I can I can look at my own business starting this you know starting this company up, and I remember the first. In fact, somebody asked me about this the other day. Go like, what was it like starting up? I said it was terrifying. I was. I was waking up for like the first three years in the middle of the night, I would wake up in a cold sweat. And I was, I was in these nightmare dreams where I had failed. Like the whole thing had fallen apart. And I wasn't so worried about like failure from a monetary standpoint, although Carrie, my, my wife was because mm-hmm. I basically, I bet and rolled the dice with our entire nest egg 
that we could make this thing work. Uh, but I was afraid of if I failed, then I would end up looking bad in front of other people. Like that was, and that drove me. Like I, I like I would get up and I would double down because I was not going to go crawl back in and say I didn't make it. You know, I've got to, I've got to, you know, go back to what I was doing before. Um, what was it like when you? I mean, were you in the same boat where you were terrified, or were you just like this ultimate confident, uh, you know, just badass human being that said, "I got this." Yeah. Well, y- you talking about um, uh, waking up in the middle of the night with cold sweats? You've just described for me last Thursday. <laughs> okay, so this is this is not like any of us of it's ever passed entirely. And of course, I'm I'm pretty much joking, but yeah, it was terrifying. And I think that had we thought it through, we probably would have never started if we had understood at every twist and turn what was involved and what materials we'd need next and what we'd have to produce. And we didn't even know what what prospects would ask for. We didn't know. We didn't even know that anybody made a video of their speech. We didn't know that. And said, do you have a a, a demo video? And we're going, what's that? I mean, we had no idea. And so really being stupid, if you will, was a a huge benefit for us. Um, When you talk about, you know, the the financial aspect, we we left our we left our jobs without much planning. We had an idea of what we wanted to do. We knew we had a message that we had delivered within the corporate setting that we thought would sell well outside, you know, to other companies. Um, We had one big financial backer. It was Mr. Visa. And, uh, you know, we said, okay, we, we've got about, we've got about six months to, to make this happen. And I think that had we had enough money to have two years to make it happen, we would have probably just screwed up for the first year and a half. And then we would have gotten serious, serious, you know? So the idea that we started out on day one with our backs up against the wall with the clock ticking, I think was really valuable for us. And so, um, you know, and I, will, and I will just tell you this one other real quick story. Uh, Andrea never gives herself enough credit for this, but um, you know, early on we uh, we went to a, um, I think it's called ATD now. At that time, it was called ASTD, and we went to this event in San Francisco. We spent a big chunk of the money that we had in our war chest. We knew that we had to make it happen, and we got up there. You know, tens of thousands of people. It's just, it just was enormous. And there was a, there was, she's smiling at me. There was a, um, uh, what do you call it? A networking event for the retail industry. And retail's where we started. Mm. And eventually we branched off into, you know, all B2C and then in regular corporate sales. Um, but we went to this event and Andrea sees this woman and her name badge um, says, Deborah Mastin, J.C. Penny, vice president. And as she tells it, the first thought she had in her mind, she had two thoughts. One was, I've got to go talk to her. And the second thought was, I cannot go talk to her, right? Because she thought there's just no, to Andrea, the name badge said, we're too big for you, small company. You know, that's, yeah. that's what it read. And she summoned all the courage she had. And she walked up and she said, hi, you know, I'm Andrea Waltz. We wrote this book here. And she hands it to her. And Deborah took the book. She flipped through the pages. She said, this is interesting. Call me Monday. Oh, by the way, do you guys do distance learning? <laughs> and Andrea said, of course we do distance learning. <laughs> And so she tracked me down and said, you're not going to believe this. I just talked to Deborah Maston at JCPenney. She wants to, she wants us to call her on Monday. And she asked if we did distance learning. And I said, what's distance learning? <laughs> and she said, I have no idea, but we're going to find out. And so a lot of that, if you want to call it confidence or chutzpah or whatever the right word is, came from the fact that we didn't have any other outs. And we'd, you know, we'd roll the dice on something big and there was no other outlet, you know, and so we took chances that we might not have taken otherwise. And if she had not approached that one person at that one event, I don't know if we'd be sitting in front of you right now because we might've run out of money. There was no other time to decide, oh, we'll do it later. We'll approach them later. We'll do some other mailing. That was the moment. And I think a lot of salespeople chicken out in that moment and they don't take the chance. Well, for me, I mean, I would rather be on the airplane flying back from San Francisco thinking about the ridiculous, embarrassing, you know, stumbling, horrible presentation I made in front of this executive at this networking event, then sit on the airplane and go like, I wonder what would have happened if I had walked up to that executive and 
tried to strike yeah. up a conversation. I would rather have some epic failure than to not do it. And that has guided us on everything. We, we, we are willing to fail. In 2009, we, I mean, we weren't making a whole lot of money at anything. I mean, we were just basically spending money. We were running on Visa cards. And I took a flyer. When I say took a flyer, like I just took a chance. And I'm like, buying a plane ticket then was a big deal. Like I literally, if I'm looking at, I'm spending $400 on a plane ticket, that's, you know, that's food. I mean, I, it was, but I bought a plane ticket and I went to New Orleans and I went to a big confidence, sim- similar to ATD. Uh, I went to Sherm mm-hmm. and I didn't have a booth, didn't have anything. Got a, I got a free pass in from someone else, go in and I knew people I wanted to meet and I found myself pacing in front of this booth with this big old huge organization that I wanted to go talk to. And I, I remember I would walk the loop around the trade show floor and would walk the loop around the trade show floor and I would kept doing it like 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 I was going to maybe, you know, ask them to go to the prom and I was like, I can't, I couldn't get the, 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 uh, the courage to go up there. And finally I'm like, like you came all this way. Are you just going to chicken out? Like go say hello. And I walked up and I just a random person in the booth, like totally random a guy named Chris Grasso. And if you're listening, Chris, thank you for the break. Uh, and I walked up Shook Chris's hand, told him what we were doing. At the at that point, we ran a big, well, we ran a, big, we ran a really small job board on Sales Gravy, but it was our build. It was our, our the thing that we needed to build cash. And I walked up, told him what we were doing, and set a meeting. And it changed everything. Like that relationship over a course of five years paid the bills. It uh, got us into 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 larger opportunities. But had I flown back home? And not have had that conversation. I don't know that we'd be here today, because it, it was it it literally flipped the switch, so that we were able to grow and become the company that we are. So yeah, I mean, I, I those like those things for salespeople and especially small business owners and entrepreneurs, like you you almost have to will yourself in some situations to just take that shot. It's why I like to say that every yes you've ever gotten required the courage to face a no. And if you are willing to do that, the yeses are out there. So we were at um, at the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville this past weekend, and we went to the Martina McBride display. Absolute go for no. So one of the greatest country music stars ever of all time, the way that she got her break and she said, this is the, the one thing that I always wanted to do is this job, is she sent an envelope with a demo in it that said requested material to an executive of a recording company. And she just, she just approached it with confidence as if. And they opened it because it said requested material. And the, the envelope is still there. In the in the display, and it and it gave her the break, like gave gave her an opportunity. So there's all kinds of places every day in your life, whether it's in sales or not, where there's an opportunity to go for no. Now let's switch to the failures. We talked about two wins. I'm going to tell you my failure. Okay, like one of my very first ones, and I want you to think about your most memorable during the course of building your business over the last 20, 25 years, like total. Oh my God! I, w- I wish this never happened. Now you said we didn't know we were supposed to have demo videos. So this is for me like 2000, like I'm the summer of 2007, spring of 2007. I'd never given a speech before, uh, other than in the corporate world, and I'd written a book called Power Principles, and I'm just trying to take anything. And so I'm in Orlando, Florida, not too far from me, the Rosen Center. And this, the I think it was the Chamber of Commerce, but somehow or another through talking myself into the place, I'd gotten a gig if they bought some books. Like that was the that was the trade off. So I hired a videographer to come to Orlando and shoot it, so I would have a video of something because I had no video, nothing. And go to the hotel that night. I'm spending money I don't have. I've got my big old box of books. Everything's set up. I get up in the morning to go to the event, and I put everything on. Like, I got my best suit on. I look in the mirror to make sure I look good. I go to put my shoes on. I got no shoes. 
I got no shoes. In the haste of like packing for this thing, I got a videographer, I got books, I got my first gig, but I got no shoes. And so I found myself like with minutes to go standing in front of a men's warehouse somewhere in Orlando, banging on the door because they're closed. But I, like, there, I saw somebody in there. I banged on the door and I begged them, please, please, please sell me a pair of shoes. And they did. They sold me some shoes. And I went to the event. And then, so I did the whole thing, right? Did Got the whole thing done. Video's terrible. I sucked. It wasn't great. But I had to sign books. So I had brought books for everybody that they had agreed to buy. And I signed them. Very first book signed in. And I signed about half of them wrong. Like the person would say, my name is Caroline. And I would write Caroline with a C. But she, oh, no, it's a K. Chunk the book. There was one book down. So I, so it was like just complete and utter disaster. It was an embarrassment. Um, what is your most memorable failure? Like crash and burn. Andrew. Oh, my gosh. There are so many. Um, do you want to talk about... A speaking, do you want to talk about the speaking issue in Las Vegas? Oh, do you want to talk about that? I, I think I hear the words Remax coming. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> I, I'll do I'll do that. Are you going to do Lincoln or what? Oh my God, there's so many. There's um, so many. Can, can I check my files? <laughs> my files? Do you want me to go first? Yes. I, I, <sighs> because, because Jeb did, a, I was going to do a, a one where I stopped prospecting because we were too busy delivering and I was so glad. I was like, oh, I don't have to prospect anymore. And then I almost crashed our entire business. So I covered that failure. That was that. OK, so now you go. Yeah, uh, this is not a dollar issue like we lost money or whatever, but um, we were we were hired and, and Remax doesn't know this story. So if they're listening you know, this is going to be the, the first time that uh, that they that they know so They're good people so, they'll, they'll laugh with you absolutely <laughs> so so they hired us to do one of one of their keynotes we were on um after gary vaynerchuk and right before joe theisman we had a nice little you know spot in their program uh they had bought six thousand books from us with custom back covers you know this was a big this was a big 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 deal for us and uh the night before i got food poisoning I mean, violent, unbelievable, the worst possible. And I don't have to describe the, the details. I think people know, you've all experienced something like this, as sick as sick can be. And I was up all night and we have a two part, you know, we speak together and we go back and forth and I tell my stories and Andrea tells her stories. And about three in the morning, I said, I'm not gonna be able to speak. There is no way I can get down there and speak. Um, you're going to have to do it. And now I'm in a panic because there's some stories that I know very well that he tells, but they're not my stories. And I, I'm thinking, can I pull them off? Do I try to pull them off or do I scrap his stories and just come up with like some new, you know, just kind of do my own stuff? But I've already sent the slides, so I don't know. So I'm just in a panic and I spend the next three hours from three to six a.m. just making notes and trying to come up with what I would do hypothetically. And then at, at, by 6 a.m., I'm like, well, I have to get ready. And I, at this point, I'm like, whatever is going to come out of my mouth is what I'm going to say. Right. And and so I tell Andrea, just go. If, if I show up, I show up. I'm going to do my best, but I can't promise anything. And finally, at about 930, I knew we were on at 10 o'clock. And meantime, <laughs> I go down. I'm shaking hands with the president of REMAX. And he's like, I'm so excited you guys are here. And I'm like, yeah. And I have no idea what's going to happen. So I am just sweating. I am so nervous. So when people say, I'm looking forward to hearing your speech, you're going, I'm looking forward to hearing it too. <laughs> yes, I am exactly. And so I'm just, I have no idea what's going to happen. So I'm just smiling and and pretending like everything is fine. People are, he's like, where's Richard? He's going to be here soon, I say. Yes. And so I pull myself together. And this is at Mandalay Bay, and it's a long way from the hotel to the to the um, convention area. I mean, it's it's over half a mile, and you know maybe that's not so bad on a typical day. When you're as sick as I was, it might as it might as well have been to, you know crossing the Gobi Desert. And I I pull myself together, I make it to the thing, I shake hands, I'm trying to act normal. I know that you should never tell anybody in advance 
You know, don't apologize and don't tell them you're sick because then they'll be watching going, oh, yeah, he's not doing a very good job um, because he's sick. You know, so I just don't say anything. Get up there. Do your job. I don't remember speaking. I vaguely remember seeing Joe Theismann off to the side waving. We waved back. And and I mean, that might have been a hallucination. I'm not sure. And we get through the we get through the program. And this was like this was a big date for us at that time. And we sold virtually no product. We were not on our game. Andrea was exhausted. I was sick. We just we just pulled ourselves through. Because my panic was at any minute on stage, he's going down. He, oh, or, <laughs> or, or or something or, worse. Or worse. <laughs> or worse. And um, so the end of the end of the story is when we get back home and she got sick then too. And then we both we finally recovered. We went in and we read the reviews from the attendees at the thing. And, you know, and the, then the reviews were, were horrible. And it was, this guy didn't even look like he had any enthusiasm Really at all. low energy. Really, he was really low energy. And I thought, you have no idea how much I put into that. So it is a, it is a failure. It is a horrible thing. But it's actually now in retrospect um, uh, a success and a, and a point of pride. But uh, it didn't feel like it at the time. Yeah. So what did you take away from that experience? Uh, well, I guess what I took away is I we are professionals. And, and so for us, I mean, literally, we would have to have a limb missing. And it would have to be actively bleeding and for, <laughs> you know, for us to not show up on stage. I mean, at all costs. And the fact, even when he said he wasn't going to make it, I thought, I think he's going to show. Like, there was even a part of me, like, my intuition just said, Richard is going to come. This is who we are. This is what we do. So the fact that we fought through it and showed up, um, because I think it would have been worse to not have your speaker show than to have your speaker come and turn in a 75 instead of a 95, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so in that way, I was proud of us for just pushing yeah, that's like our company culture. Like this sells gravy is number one is we show up no matter what. I don't care what it takes. We've delivered in hurricanes. We've delivered in no power. I've driven all night long because of airplane issues all night to get to the next place and like walk out of my car in, on the stage, having had no sleep, whatever it takes. And I think that uh, I think that's like you said, there's just you're going to show up. The show's going to go on. That matters. What I learned was when I'm signing books, I ask people to spell their name. Even if it's Rick, <laughs> uh, spell your name. And you'd be amazed that sometimes when I say spell your name and they spell it and I'm go, oh my God, I'm so glad I asked that. Because you, you, it's the precision of taking the time and not just assuming that you know something that you don't know. Right. And we did learn from that and what we learned um uh, really two lessons. One was from that event was that you have to have a second set of slides. You have to know what happens if, you know, if one mm -hmm. person's going to go down, how are you going to handle it? And from another event that was very similar to that, our slides went out. We were five minutes in and boom, the, the slides went, thing went, we're working on it. And uh, we, because of the Remax event and because we were prepared now, we had every slide printed out and we had notes written in big Sharpie in case slides ever went out. And we just, we said, okay, no problem. We can take it from here. And we didn't, we you didn't got, miss a beat. And with about two minutes left in the program, the slides came on. <laughs> and how important that is for sales professionals who you're yeah. delivering a big presentation and you walk into the room and there's a technical issue, show's got to go on. You got to keep moving. And you cannot lose your cool because mm -hmm. that makes your audience or whoever's in the room so much more uncomfortable because in a way I think even when you're making a sales presentation people are they're not necessarily rooting for you but they're with you it's they it, it's a collaborative you know you're kind of co-creating this experience and so if you are freaking out it's going to be really uncomfortable so you're better off to just say you know what let's just let's have a conversation let me just kind of let me tell you about this instead of showing yep. you. Absolutely, I, I think you're. I think you're totally right. I think that your demeanor does means everything. Your confidence means everything. I was, uh, and by the way, I always check now. I mean, every trip I take, are there shoes in that bag? Always. <laughs> Do I have shoes? Um, 
I was in a situation very similar with, with, with but not slides going out. So we we had worked we worked with the international company, and there was some translation issue in all of this. But the 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 event was supposed to be what we call Jeb Unplugged, and that is that I I go to stage and then all I do is take qu- audience questions, and I, it's my favorite thing to do. People love it. And it's because because essentially it is in a keynote speech built around them. I know my material, but you ask me the question now. The the with well, the content that's delivered is in the shape of your question. So I got no slides. I got nothing. I got a bottle of water, and I'm walking on stage. And all I'm going to do is have a conversation with the audience. And I get on, and the person who introduces me uh, introduces me and says, "All right, now Jeb's going to give us a 60 minute presentation." And in my brain, there were a couple of cuss words that went off. But I mean, there were some expletives like, oh, my God, like, what? I, I'm not prepared for any of this. I'm like, I'm prepared to come up here and do Jeb Unplugged. So he just throws it out there. And the expectation was there was going to be a keynote. Everything got lost in translation. And thank the Lord. Like, I know my decks. Like, I know my slides. But my slides for me are just visuals. Like, most of my slides, like, people spend a lot of money and they have – all these like slide builders build these fan. My slides are a lot of times it's a picture of a lion. All that is is a visual cue for me about what I'm going to say next. So I had to like in the the matter of just a couple of seconds, take a breath, think like run through everything that I was going to do, pick one, and then roll through it like I normally would. And it turned out to be okay, but. But that, like that, in that moment, if I had lost my my cool, it would have ruined everything for this audience that was expecting me to to show up and be awesome. So, the, but it, the, it was the practice, it was the run through of those things so many times that just allowed me to step into that. But I, t- I got to tell you, it was I was like for a moment, it was absolute pure terror. What am I going to do? Let me ask you another question, uh, because I think a lot of people, like keynote speakers, public speakers, uh, some people step into that. Some people get really nervous. It, is there a time or a situation where you've been delivering a keynote that you've walked in front of an audience or walked into a stage where you felt like nervous? Yes, let me tell you. So I do not consider myself a natural presenter. Richard is completely natural storyteller oh my god this guy man it drives me crazy he and this is going to sound really horrible when i say this he spoke at his father's funeral and it was beautiful it was amazing and it was funny he told funny stories and everyone it was just like great like he's just any speech he gives so at the at the worst moment he gives this great speech the best moments he gives a great and it doesn't seem to matter like what the topic is. He's just I think it's because he's logical, but he's a natural presenter. I am not not a natural presenter. And I've also had some traumatic presentation experiences as a kid. I decided, in fact, literally, you could have asked me, Andrea, here are 300 professions. Rank them all and, you know, in order and professional speak- speaker would have been 301 because I would have said, like, that's it's not even on the list. I will do anything. Bricklayer. Put anything in front of that because of my traumatic experience. But it wasn't until I le- we started our business and I became so passionate about Go For No to the point where I found myself wanting to talk about it. And so back in the days where before Zoom and all of that, we would do a lot of these teleseminars and we would start off with scripts. We had scripts and I would and I wrote the scripts and we wrote them together. And and then the teleseminars kind of evolved to where we didn't even really use the script as much. And we would do Q&A. And and this was kind of in the mid 2000s. And I just fell in love with presenting. And I had done so I had done training at Lens Crafters. So I guess I'm selling myself a little short because I had done two-day orientations and things like that. But it was, I don't know, I felt like it was different. It was, di- it's different. Training is different than speaking, keynoting. It's it's just a whole different vibe. And, but my worst nightmare, Jeb, would be to go on a stage and forget what I was saying. And because I'm not Mr. Logical, natural presenter over here, I, that that was my biggest fear. So our biggest audience ever up to this point 
was uh, the Pampered Chef, and it was uh, six, between six and seven thousand. And Richard and I had had this conversation where he and I always tell him, "Don't wordsmith me," because I tell you, if you tell me a word, I'm going to forget it. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> word you tell me that I need to say, it's not coming out of my mouth. I promise you, because that my brain just doesn't work that way. So we're talking about how. When you're on an emotional roller coaster of yes and no, right? You're up and down, and yes and no is this emotional roller coaster. Well, the shortest distance between two points is not up and down, it's a straight line. And that seems very reasonable when I say it. And Rich is explaining this to me. And I said, Richard, I know that, but saying that phrase, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, doesn't roll off my brain for some reason. But I'm speaking, I'm doing the keynote, and I'm talking about being on the emotional roller coaster to the audience. And then I proceed to say, and the shortest, and then I go like, what is it? What are you saying? Are you, what is, where's the line? What's the point? What's the distance? What am I supposed to say next? I mean, I just lost it because that phrase is not something that's in my head. And I just thought, Andrea, don't continue. Do not continue with this thought. You are going to blow it. You're going to say something weird, like the shortest <laughs> dis distance between two hills is a is a hammer, and it's just going to knock. And so I stopped, and I just paused for a second, and I said, I just totally lost my train of thought. And then I just picked right up, and I just continued about the emotional roller coaster. And of course, in my head, I was a little mortified. I thought, oh, that was not cool. But I I think from a confidence standpoint, I handled it smooth enough. I didn't panic. I didn't freak out. I didn't run off the stage, which were all my fears, right? That even later, one of the people in the audience came up, and we were greeting a lot of people throughout this big training event. And she said, that was so amazing the way you handled that. And I said, oh, thank you. But surviving my biggest fear, I say to this day, was so empowering because I learned that I didn't die and that I knew my material enough to just pick right up. And you just when when the thing that you fear worst happens and you survive it, uh, it makes you stronger. It makes you better. When I first started and I've always like I'm different than you when I was in high school. Uh, I like stood in front of the entire school and I'd gone to the model UN and I delivered an entire speech with a British accent. Like, so I've always been a person that like, I like being on stage. I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and, and, you know, and I don't real like I go on stage. I have no idea. Like I walk off. Sometimes I have no idea what I said. Like I, I, I walk up there and I'm, I'm nervous and I'm worried. And I want to get everything right. And I practice and practice and practice. And I step on stage and, Everything just disappears. Like it just flows. But when I first started this, this is what I would do to myself. I would give a speech and then I would go back and replay it. And I would beat myself up. Like I would, I would be so, like I would be, like I was embarrassed. I, I, I can't believe you said that or I can't believe I did that or I missed this or I got that wrong or there was a, and I would, it was just excruciating. Like I would just, I, and I would I'd be in my hotel room thinking, I don't even want to go face anybody. I'm horrible. And then people would like, that was the greatest thing I ever got. We'd get a letter like, I, that was the, you're the best speaker I've ever heard. And what I had to come to the realization of, and it took me a while to get there, is that nobody really notices when you make a mistake. They don't pay any attention to it. You do. You see that. You feel it. But they don't. At all, like they—they they don't. I mean, unless unless you like, you show up and totally flop it, or you throw a big temper tantrum in the middle because something's not working. They don't know. And when you respond to adversity with grace in front of them, they say, "Wow, that's a person who's just like me." I mean, I, that was pretty good. I made those mistakes too. And once I got past that, that people don't really notice, then I just learn how to be myself. Like, I, you know, I was—I spent a lot of time comparing myself against someone like Anthony Anarino who never makes a mistake. If you ever watch Anthony on stage, he never makes a mistake. Everything is perfect. If you watch me on stage, I, I look like a dummy that grew up on a dirt road that has no idea how to use the English language. I mean, sometimes I just make stuff up. Like my wife will go, is that really a word? And I go, I think it is. She goes, you shouldn't say that anymore. It's not a word. But nobody notices. What they notice is that I'm giving them everything I've got.
Like I'm passionate about this. And I think that when you start thinking about your presentations as a salesperson, maybe you're not standing in front of 6,000 people. You, and, and I have been nervous in front of crowds. Like the, the, the one crowd I was in front of like 25,000 people, I was doing a commencement speech and I wasn't nervous when I first walked up, but I had about 45 minutes of being on stage before it was my turn to give the commencement speech. And the longer I sat there and the longer I looked at all these people, the more I thought, this is these are these people don't know me. They don't know my message. Am I going to get this right? And it was a thing I had to memorize. Boy, I talked myself into like I was like holding onto the chair trying to burn energy. But but now like I just I've just leaned into this is who I am. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not going to be Anthony. I'm not going to be like Victor Antonio, maybe the greatest sales speaker that ever walked the face of the earth. Like he is insane. He's so good. I'm just not those people. I got to be me. And I, I think that's what, when you fall into that and then people see the energy that you're bringing, that's what they love. That's what they, that's what they fall into. Yeah. Well, first off, um, Anthony's initials are AI because he is a robot. <laughs> Um, and I mean that in the kindest way. He is so smooth. I mean, yep. he just just nails it. I'm not that way when when I speak. Uh, quite frankly, Andrea, you know, mentioned that you know I'm a I'm a storyteller, and I can't imagine speaking without stories. I can't imagine learning without stories. I can't imagine my life without being entertained by stories. Whether it's you know podcasts I listen to or uh, movies on Netflix. I mean. Stories are like this the centerpiece of my life. And I wonder sometimes when salespeople go out to do a presentation, do they realize the power of stories? I mean, do they really understand the fact that we 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 learn in stories and we get engaged in stories? And I've, you know, I've seen 90 minute sales presentations. There wasn't a single story in it. It was slide after slide after slide after feature after benefit, you know. And, um, and it was like, it was like, yeah, but I got to the benefits. So, so I did a good job. Yeah. But you never got them to picture owning the product or using the service. You never gave an example. You never said, let me tell you a story about one of our customers who used our product and how it solved their problem. You know, the, the stories draw you in so much. And Andrew and I've had this conversation a lot. If you, you watch a lot of speakers, they get up. So they get introduced and they go like, hi, everybody, um, is, is this thing on? Um, uh, you know, the old days. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a real thrill to be here. I want to thank, I want to thank Bob Johnson, the president, for having me. I'd like to thank the board. You know, they're 30 seconds in and the audience is, they're, they're gone. The audience has already made a decision. This is going to be bad. This is going to be boring. Maybe I could like start thinking of something else right? And they just, they just drift away. But if people would use stories more often in the, you know, the beginning of a sales presentation, I don't even know what this product is. I have no idea what this product is, but can you imagine, you know, they say, okay, you know, um, I, we're, we're ready for you. Go ahead. And they say in 1952, five guys got into a boat in the Northern coast of Ireland and they started drifting at sea. They had no idea where they were going to end up, but do you know what happened? Everyone in that room is leaning forward. Everybody is. And by the engaged. way, everybody in the podcast audience, as soon as you did that, yeah. leaned in. Exactly. All of you. Exactly. And I don't have a story there. I, I'm, named, but I could make one yeah. up. I mean, I'm not saying people should make up stories. I'm saying find stories that work for you when you're, you know, when yeah. you're um, presenting your product, and it will change everything. And you need to to have stories that you layer in as you deliver your presentation. So that's my MO. Like when I walk on stage, I start with a story. And I don't start with, hello, how are you doing? I start with the story. Right. And instantly you have people. And then as I'm delivering a keynote, the stories are placed strategically throughout so that because people's attention goes up and down, as soon as the attention is getting to a place where it's starting to go down, I'll spike it again with another story. Yep. That's what drives people. Plus, it's more fun. And, you know, and that's what really like the other thing that got me was I was thinking, well, my content, you know, it's not like you think about Anthony, like Anthony's got deep content. And he, by the way, Anthony tells a mean story. He's good. And he's just so precise. And. And we talk all the time, so he knows I'm not talking bad about him behind his back. But I'm like, this, like his his content's good. 
Like my content is not as deep as this content. Like my content is this and that and this. And what I realized along the way, back to you got to be who you are, was that people will come to me and say, that was the best story. Like that, that was the thing. And even now, like I'm walking through an airport and people, somebody will grab me and go, Jeb Blunt, is that you? Oh my God. You know, I was at this event and I saw you and that story you told about, and that's what they remember. They don't remember anything else I said. They remember the story and it makes an emotional connection. Yeah. Well, our entire brand came out of us telling the quote, go for no story, um, which we didn't call it that at the time. We called it the Herald story. And people would come up and say, I love that go for no story. <laughs> and we were like, go for no. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. People keep saying that phrase and like, maybe that's our brand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so tell stories and you'll be shocked at what comes from them. That's true. Our entire brand is built on that one story that happened to him. And everything else that has spun off of that has come from that. And then people remember, they call it the Herald story. Or they, like they come and they go, can you tell the chicken story? Can you tell the button story? And people, what's crazy is, and with groups that I come back to again and again, they'll say, could you make sure you tell this story? I'm like, I've already told you that story. They want to hear the story again. That's what I find so fascinating about human beings. Absolutely. It's funny because um, I remember uh, Zig Ziglar, we were there for his 80th birthday and uh, he he told this story, and the story was how he was hired by this company, and he was going back to present for him. He said, they've already had me like six times. I've got to come up with new material, you know? So, and he had the story he used to do about about the silver pump, how he would, you know, he was pumping the water out of a well, and he says, well, I'm not going to bring the pump this time and tell that story. They've seen it so many times, and he went up, gave his presentation, and the president came up and said, where's the pump? I hired you because of the pump story. <laughs> And he says, I never made that mistake again. <laughs> it's a, it's incredible, isn't it? That people, like, they lean into it. So for salespeople, you want to de develop the stories about what you've done for other people. I mean, and it's a, it's a really simple formula. If you think about it, for a salesperson, what was their challenge? What was their issue? They're floating in a boat away from the coast of Ireland. Pretty simple, right? And what was your recommendation? Like, how did you solve the problem? Well, you know, we had an opportunity to work with them to give them a motor. And then what was the plan result? They didn't die. But if you but if you roll that through there, like the story about the wheelbarrow, I mean, Lord have mercy. Like I'm to, I'm totally leaned into that story. But it's that it's all you got to think about is there was there was something that was wrong. And then we gave them some recommendations. And then this is what happened. And if you shape those stories and you can tell them at the right time, people lean into that. Plus, you're leveraging social proof to get them to say yes. Absolutely. And, and I think if you even think about it, like I love just psychology of uh, how people learn and all of that. And, and think about when you were a kid, you wanted to hear the same story over and over and over again. Maybe there's something in our psychology about the familiarity, about repetition, uh, something that's comfortable. Um, and also, I think when you hear a story and you like it and it resonates with you, you say, I want to experience that again. I mean, stories yeah. are experiences. Well, I mean, you've you've heard all too well. This is a Taylor Swift song. This is a 10 minute song, but you've heard it a million times because you play it over and over and over again on your phone. And then you drop a grand so you can go watch her sing it again on stage. Right. So why do you do that? Because there is that comfort level. And what it is is dopamine. Like it's the words are chemicals. Stories are chemicals. They 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 create a, a feeling in uh, in someone's brain that then that connect that feeling gets connected to you. Now, Richard, thinking about stories for a mm -hmm. moment as we close this podcast, what is your favorite Andrea story? Oh my, you are really you well, you're catching me off guard. My favorite. I caught the storyteller off guard. Yeah. I know. How that is that? rare. Yeah. He's not silent very often. I don't know. I mean, gosh, it could be. My, my favorite Andrea story. Yeah. Hmm. Silence well, on the podcast. It, yeah. It's, si not, it's not allowed. Yeah, silence. I could make up a story because I'm, I'm good at that. <laughs> you are good at that. Um, don't make up anything. Yeah. I, I, I oh, don't oh, know. What is your favorite Richard story? Yeah. Let me think here while you're going. Um, oh, my gosh. Okay, I'll give you my favorite Richard story. This is a good one. This is a power of persistence and and someone who, um, you know, doesn't give up. 
So it's two thousand. It's two thousand. I think it's two thousand. And we had our business now. We're about two years in, and I'm doing all the sales and marketing. Richard is delivering presentations for us. He goes on. He wakes up early in the morning. His stomach is kind of hurting. And it's funny, we have all these health problems. <laughs> Please hire us. We, I promise that we're fine. We're very healthy. Um, but so I preface that before I tell this story. Um, but he has a stomach problem. He goes to Denver. He delivers uh, a program for Furniture Row. He's coming back. And this is before, like, really before smartphones. So, so I don't talk to him. Like, I talk to him maybe at the airport or whatever. And um, I'm in the airport in San Diego picking him up. And it was one of the rare occasions where uh, I decided to actually walk in and greet him. Um, and I know this is 2000 because it's before 9-11. So I'm at the gate waiting to greet him instead of at the curb waiting to just have him throw his bag in and us go. And I'm waiting and waiting. And we're not even married yet, Jeb. And he doesn't come off the plane. Like everybody comes off the plane. I'm like, where the heck is he, right? And then I hear somebody Somebody call over the loudspeaker, Andrea Fenton. Well, that is not my name. But if I was smart and paying any attention, I would know that had to do with me because my my partner over here is Richard Fenton. Finally, it dawns on me, oh, they're calling me. And they say, um, your husband is down in on the tarmac. They have an ambulance and they're taking him right to Mercy Hospital. And I'm like, what? I haven't talked. To, I talked to him at the airport. He had a little bit of a stomach ache. So we go to Mercy Hospital he ends up in the hospital for 17 days with pancreatitis. Oh, no. Yes. and But the funny part of the story is that um, by about day 10, and they said, you know, you can't leave until this infection has gone away. Because um, this is very serious. Like, you can have small bouts of pancreatitis. This is very serious. And uh, so they said, you're not going anywhere. Well, he was desperate to get out. And I'm canceling dates on his and rescheduling things and stuff like that. So it was kind of a, it was a big crisis for us at that time. This is day, day 10. And the doctor comes in the doctor's like, listen, you know, you got to be patient. He goes, we have a woman on the seventh floor who's been here for seven months. And Richard's motto started to become, I will not be the woman on the seventh floor. <laughs> And he would scream it to the nurses and he would get up. They would come and take his temperature to see if the feet, like the infection had gone down. He would get up. He would go take a uh, washcloth, cold washcloth, and put it in his ear <laughs> and try to cool <laughs> off his ears so that somehow I guess he thought that the, uh, you know, the temperature reading. He was doing anything he could to get out of that hospital. He was like, I'm getting out. I'm not the woman on the seventh floor. Every time a doctor would come in, I'm not the woman on the seventh floor. And he was out seven days later. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Your turn. Well, you're not going to believe this, but it's a health story. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 oh, I, no. I could do, oh I could, gosh. I could, I mean, I could do like great things you've done in the world of selling and everything, but we're, re the, we're really healthy we, people. We are. We're really <laughs> healthy people, but our favorite stories include not being healthy. <laughs> no, um, uh, we went to, um, my, uh, my sister-in-law's house oh in North God. Carolina for for Thanksgiving, and in the middle of the dinner, Andrea gets a gets a stomach ache. Okay, you're gonna do stomach ache. I get to do stomach ache, and she's in the bathroom, and I'm like, "Are you gonna come out to dinner?" And she goes, oh, "I'll be there in a minute." And anyway, um, she's sick all night. But the next morning, oh, she feels great, and we were heading to um, Hilton Head, and we were gonna go to Hilton Head for a day, and then we were going to Savannah, and we were gonna stay at the um, Mansion on Forsyth. Mansion on Forsyth. And it's, it's really going to be this amazing, you know, three days. And we go to Hilton Head and we're playing miniature golf. And she's like, oh, my stomach hurts again. My stomach hurts again. I said, well, this is ridiculous. We need to go doc to a doctor. No, I don't want to go to a doctor on the road. We need to go to a doctor at home. I don't trust doctors on the road or something like <laughs> that. And so anyway, oh, but the stomach ache passed. It got okay. Then we get to Savannah and then we're in the hotel. She goes, Oh, my stomach hurts. Like I said, pack the bag, grab your stuff. We're going now. And she refused to go to the doctor in Savannah. I said, well, let's take you to the Savannah hospital. She goes, no, I want to go to a doctor at home. So anyway, throw her in the car, race home for six hours from Savannah back to Orlando, went straight to the doctor. The doctor pushed his finger on her stomach and she went, ah, and he said, take her to the emergency room now. And needless to say, she had an appendicitis and... An hour later, she was in surgery. She 
is the most wonderful, loving, smart, tenacious person in the world. But God, she is stubborn sometimes. She, when she digs her heels in, there is there is almost no fighting it, and you literally have to grab her, you know, drag her kicking and, stre- and screaming. So I, I love you, but right before surgery, the <laughs> surgeon came in and he said. Um, how are you feeling? And I said, don't worry about me. How are you feeling? I want to know that you're, <laughs> are you up to this? This was right after Thanksgiving. I want to know that you're like, are you here with me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you my, my favorite Andrea story. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, and we'll close out with this because it, it was at Outbound uh, 2019 and you were on stage. You didn't come with her. Right. And I'd never seen you speak. I'd, but and I was trying to run this conference, so I'm I'm run I'm like a chicken with its head cut off at this conference, trying to run all over the place, keep things going. And I remember this just one moment, and because I didn't get to see her, I got to see pieces of it because I'm out in the lobby getting people in, just doing things. And there was this moment, and it was complete clarity for me about what sales is. You were on stage, and you had a Dr. Seuss book in your hand. At green eggs and ham, yeah. and you were reading it. And this is what's crazy about stories. Like you said, people want to hear stories over and over again. Everybody in that audience has heard the story because their mom read it to them a million times. The entire audience is leaning forward. It's complete silence. Nobody's moving. Nobody's getting up. They're all paying attention to the stage as she reads green eggs and ham. And you went through the process of going through, you know, I don't like it on a train or in a plane. And you get to the the punchline, and I do, I do, I do, I do like green eggs and ham. I think that's what it says at the end, but something close to that. And as I as I listened to the story, I was like, I, I just watched this masterful moment on stage where everybody was, com- and they were completely together because they all understood it at the same time. And I'm like, that's what sales is. It's just asking for what you want and being persistent about it and going for the no, because that book is just a go for no book. And it was just this beautiful moment. And it's it's tattooed in my brain just because the entire thing was just, you used the word magical earlier in a different video, but it was just magical. Mm-hmm. And and that I, we've we've I've known you longer than I've known you, but that was the moment. Like that, that led to this moment, the, the, us spending time together, because that's when I knew like y'all are legit. Like this is, it's, you've taken a concept that is so crucial, not just in sales, but in your entire life. If you want to get ahead, you have to go for no. And you dial it into a formula that just makes it super simple for people to lean into, to consume it, and then to put it into practice. And for that, we thank you because you've done a great service to the sales world. You wrote one of the greatest books in the world, Go For No, and then you follow that up with When They Say No, which is another important book. So if you ever if you read Go For No and you hadn't read When They Say No, get that book. Uh, and then you've got another book. We're not going to tell them the title of this book because it's so good. It's so good that Richard said, you can't have it. I just want to make sure you're not, you're not taking this title. Uh, but that, that book will be following behind this, and, that, and I think that's going to that's gonna really start laying down uh, the groundwork of, like, how do you begin to, to shift your emotional state uh, so, that, uh, so that you're in that place? But that's my favorite memory, and thank you all so much for joining me on the Sales Gravy Podcast. Jeb, it's been so much fun. We're not leaving. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're very lucky to have met you as well, and thank you for having us. Well, thank you. And folks, uh, make sure that you go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. And listen, if you've got a team of salespeople, whether it's big or small, we've got a solution for you at Salesgrave University. So go to Salesgrave University, check it out. And if you've never taken a course, go to learn.salesgravy.com. Use the code free course to get your very first course, any course you want, for free. We'll see you next time on the Salesgravy Podcast.